them again. They came to Pumpy and Jim, sweet Danny and Tyrone. They fled from persecution and from poverty at home. They were the proud Scotch Irish who left their Ulster's climb. They fought the planet for the Bunker Hill, the Brandy Wong. They fought for independence and held to win the day. Then all the breed were presidents of the mighty USA. But when the early settlers left Ulster, it wasn't the mighty USA. It was the colonies of America, British owned and British ruled. But there was land to be had for the asking, and that was what the Ulstermen wanted. The land-hungry Scotch-Irish spread across the plains to the Pennsylvania valleys, North and South Carolina, setting up their log cabins, clearing the brush with the most primitive tools, doing the thing they knew best, farming. But why did they leave the north of Ireland, braving the Atlantic Ocean, their tiny sailing ships, and enduring the incredible hazards of the American wilderness? Well, here there were hazards in plenty. Remember the words of the ballad, they fled from persecution and from poverty at home. Persecution? Well, for instance, in the 18th century, Presbyterian ministers were forbidden to practice their calling and all marriages performed by Presbyterian pastors were declared illegal. In the 18th and into the 19th century, small farmers often had their rents raised iniquitously by rapacious landlords. If they couldn't pay, they were evicted to beg or starve by the roadside. But the Scotch-Irish were stubborn, liberty-loving people, and it was the seed and breed of these stubborn people who became presidents of America. Andrew Jackson, seventh president, 1829 to 1837. James Buchanan, 15th president, 1857 to 1861. Ulysses Simpson Grant, 18th president, 1869 to 1877. Chester Allen Arthur, 21st president, 1881 to 1885. William McKinley, 25th President, 1897, assassinated, 1901. Thomas Woodrow Wilson, 28th President, 1913 to 1921. All these and eight more became the first gentlemen of America. In fact, more than a quarter of all the American presidents came of Ulster stock. They were masters of the White House for 56 of the 92 years between Andrew Jackson and Woodrow Wilson. What was the background of these famous men? Where did their ancestors come from? Old Carrickburgers Castle stands on fair and grim shore. The before is the name of a town land a short mile away from this castle of Carrickfergus on the coast of Antrim in the north of Ireland. About its walls for over 500 years history had been made. The castle had been built by that notorious Norman knight John de Courcy. The equally notorious King John visited the castle. Edward the Bruce besieged it for a year before he took it. Here William, Prince of Orange, William III of England, landed on his way to the Battle of the Boyne. In 1760, the town and castle were captured by the French. 
and tradition has it that the defenders, having run out of bullets, tore the steel buttons off their uniforms and used them to charge their muskets. But one of the world's movers and shakers came not from this stately pile, but from a humble farm a short step away in the townland of Bonnie before. The family name was Jackson. Of the homestead, all that remains is this. Over a hundred years ago, the cottage was razed to the ground to make way for a railway line. In 1765, Andrew Jackson, his father Hugh, his wife Elizabeth and their sons Robert and Hugh abandoned their home here and their life of grinding poverty and took ship for the Carolinas. Two years after their arrival in South Carolina, Andrew the father died. Five days before, Elizabeth had given birth to another Andrew, their third son and the future president. When the young Jackson was only nine, the revolution broke in the country. At the age of 13, he fought with his elder brother Robert at the Battle of Hanging Rock. They were both captured by the British and thrown into jail. On their release, Robert died. And a year later, Andrew was left on his own when his mother also died. Now he began to earn the nickname that was to be put on him later in life, Old Hickory, because he was as tough as that. He fought two duels. He became a lawyer. He married a woman two years before her husband divorced her. He was fond of horse racing, cockfighting, drinking. But he was also a major general of the rabble that the United States called an army. And leading that rabble at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, he defeated the Indians. And at Chalmette trounced Wellington's veterans, saving New Orleans for America. He... Ah, but for the rest, you'll have to read your history books, for we have another place to go. This once was a cozy wee homestead In the rolling county Tyrone There settled a man of the Buchanan clan Intending to make it his home the seas of the world far and wide, and James Buchanan was twenty-one when he turned his face to the setting sun, and sailed on the outgoing tide, and sailed on the How hard it must have been for a family to leave this pleasant countryside. The rich, fertile lands and the beautiful Camoan River teeming with trout and salmon. It is perhaps significant that the family moved to Donegal before they emigrated, for this scene was not so peaceful as it appeared. Secret societies calling themselves Oak Boys and Steel Boys had been pressing for agrarian reform. For those tenant farmers who wouldn't join their ranks, the penalty was sharp and swift. Behind these trees could lurk attackers, and the whole province of Ulster was disturbed by their depredations. In 1783, young James Russell Buchanan said farewell to Donegal and took ship for America. His son, James Buchanan, became the 15th president of the United States and is quoted as once saying, my Ulster blood is a priceless heritage and I can never be too grateful to the grandparents from whom I derived it. Now here was born of the Simpson clan the great granddaddy of a warlike man. The young fella could a tanner have become, but he followed up the music of the fife and drum, which you fall down, 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 the down, 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 down,
On the field of battle he achieved great fame. He liked his liquor when his work was done. And Lincoln said, let that man alone with your dal 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 on the dinner day. Isabel Simpson, a sprightly 87, comes from the same stock as President Grant. It matters nothing to her that Grant showed bad generalship at the Battle of Shiloh in 1861, though he redeemed himself brilliantly afterwards. When the denunciations against him reached a peak, Abraham Lincoln exclaimed, I cannot replace this man. He fights. To his kinswoman, Grant was and always will be a hero. Uh, I have a little story concerning them that I feel I should not tell you. It's concerning the drink question. <laughs> I'm a little opposed to drink. And, uh, well, it was that uh, there was complaints went in to Lincoln um, that this general was taking too much drink. And uh, Lincoln said, well, would you get the brand of drink he takes? And we'll get some more of it to put a little cut into some of the other officers. He took too much drink, and, but he was a wonderful man, and a very kind man. Poor, I believe, even though he was a general, he hadn't all the money they wanted. But, uh, and then when he uh, became general, became uh, president, rather, uh, and ended the days so he went into business with a man who let him down terribly and squandered all his money, just absolutely left him penniless. And he was in a very bad way about this, to leave his wife without any money and his family. Anyway, he started in to write his memoirs, and he wrote it, and made lots of dollars. I wouldn't mind having some of them over here. <laughs> Near Polly Becky Billy jump up on the Antrim Hills Was born Willie Arthur, he learned to plough the drills He remembered his mother making butter at the churn And drove the little turf cart beside the flow and burn But Willie was a scholar and went to college too Says he, there's nothing for me here, I'll start me life with you I sent them for America, where there will make me stand. And the eldest son became the very highest in the land. And in this hilly and wind-swept part of County Antrim, in the townland of Dreen, you may still see the little turf cart hitched to the sure-footed donkey that can walk where the modern tractor would get bogged down. In this farmhouse, William Arthur, father of President Chester Allen Arthur, was born in 1796. The family was what we call in Ulster well-doing, for they were able to send young William to college, a privilege accorded very few country children in those days. What impelled a substantial farming family to emigrate, we can't tell, but they did. William Arthur became a teacher, then a clergyman. He married and on the 5th of October, 1830, his son, Chester Allen Arthur, was born at Furfield, Vermont. This is a site that William Arthur was to remember all his life, making butter with the plunge or staff churn. In some small farmhouses, it's done much the same way today. Two hours hard work before the butter breaks, as we say. Then, when the butter was ready, it was moulded into various shapes to catch the eye of the customer. For butter was a precious commodity and wasn't just for the consumption of the family. The bulk of it was taken into market and sold, not for profit, for there was little cash profit in the early 19th century. But it helped to get the other commodities the farm needed. And this was the kind of peaceful rural life and the farm that William Arthur left unaware that 65 years later, his son, Chester Allen Arthur, would be the 21st president of the United States of America. A young man stood by the shining river and sadly gazed where the waters of the 
David the Weaver, David McKinley, lived here in what is now an outbuilding at Dervok in County Antrim. An ancestor, James a Trooper, had fought at the Battle of the Boyne. Today, the house is a mere shell. But what was it really like inside? Well, fortunately for us, the Ulster Folk Museum have done a lot of research on the subject, and here we can see what amounts to a fairly idealized picture of what the McKinley homestead may have been like in the 18th and 19th centuries. And to take us on a sort of conducted tour of the homestead, Philip Wilson, the education officer of the Ulster Folk Museum. Philip, being a country boy myself, I knew that the open hearth, the open turf fire was a focal point for all the family activity. Yes, it was indeed. It was around a fire such as this that James the Trooper and his wife may have sat in the evenings and around which she would have uh, done her baking. And you can see there the three-legged pots used for boiling the potatoes, uh, making the soups and stews. Uh, you can also see the uh, implement there used for grilling perhaps the herring, which they would have caught locally. Beside the fire is the settled bed. Uh, this was used uh, in its present position during the daytime for people to sit at, and at night it would open out and make a bed perhaps for the parents or perhaps even for several of the children. Above it are the sheep shears, and just in front of it is the great wheel used for spinning wool. The finely scrubbed deal table was used for baking, for preparing the bread for baking. You can see the soda bread, the nice freshly baked loaves. Salt was, of course, a valuable commodity in those days, and the salt box kept the salt nice and dry. Opposite the fire was always the dresser, with its um, nicely cleaned plates, its mugs, and its bowls for soups and stews. Butter, of course, was produced on the farm. There's the plunge churn, uh, which provided the people with uh, many hours of healthy exercise. Up above, uh, one can see the uh, ceiling, the heavy purlins there and the roof timbers on top, and also the, the scraws into which the scallops of the thatch would be pushed. Well, in the bedroom, the scraws or the sods of earth have been covered over by the ceiling timbers here, uh, perhaps to prevent pieces of earth or pieces of straw or even mice from falling down from the roof. Uh, two beds here covered with their patchwork quilts and above one of them the sampler perhaps produced by a member of the family. Uh, the cradle, um, a very common piece of equipment in those days, and the washing equipment, the wash basin, the jug and the towel rail there. Philip, how authentic is this as a representation, say, of the McKinley Cottage in the middle of the 18th century? Well, as you mentioned earlier, it's highly idealised. Uh, I would think that a lot of it is perhaps more 19th century than 18th, uh, although some of the furniture may date from the 18th century. The descendant of this family, 25th President William McKinley, died at the hands of an assassin in April 1901. There's a tiny little farmstead nestling in the sparrow. Where the snowdrops bloom in thousands To defy the winter's chills And the bannock bread is baking on the 
Townland of Dergolt in the county of Tyrone. They say that in the year 1807, a young man of 20 lived in this cottage. He'd been born here, and by the time he reached 20, he was getting itchy feet. Because unlike his contemporaries in this area, he didn't work at the farming or farm labouring. He'd served his time as a printer in the small town of Straban, a couple of miles away. He thought he wasn't getting anywhere. So in the year 1807, at the age of 20, with little more than the clothes on his back and a few pounds in his pocket, he took ship for America. His name, James Wilson. Today, people, not only from America, but from all over the world, make a pilgrimage to this homestead. For the older ones can remember Woodrow Wilson. They recall his efforts to keep America out of the First World War. They remember him as a creator of the League of Nations, paradoxically an alliance that America refused to enter. But what about his grandfather James in the year 1807? What were conditions like? Well, the peasant farmer was in a pretty parlous state. Only a few years later, a contemporary was to write of a farm complex of about 500 acres supporting 40 families. And when the lease fell in, 28 to 30 of these families were dispossessed. That's about 150 people. What happened? What did that mean? It meant they were chucked out onto the street. What were they allowed to take with them? Well, the contemporary writes, they were allowed to take with them the old roofs of the cabins, that is, the rotten timber and the rotten straw, and with these, they contrived to erect stands upon the highway. The men could get no employment. The women and children had no resource but to go and beg. And it was a most affecting scene to behold them upon the highway, not knowing where to go. Well, things were not quite so bad here in the north, but they were in a very bad way. And it was from this Ireland that young James Wilson, with the Scotch-Irish adventurousness, decided to seek a new life in a new land. But not everybody sought the new life. And there are still Wilsons here at Dergold. Susanna Wilson, who has a farm nearby, can turn her hand to baking griddled bread, exactly the way it was done a century and a half ago. And bread was important. There were no supermarkets in those days and no bread shops in these remote parts. You baked your own bread if you wanted any. But where did you get the meal or the flour? Well, the man who grew corn or oats brought his grain to the miller at harvest time and the miller ground it for him and took a certain proportion as payment. So you got your flour from the miller. But it wasn't often you paid him cash because you seldom had cash. You'd maybe pay him with half a dozen laying hens or maybe a side of pork for each small farm killed its own pigs. Of course, everything depended on a good supply of turf or peat because the heat from this warmed the house and baked the cake or bannock of griddle bread, the papers to keep dust from falling on it. John Wilson, Susanna's brother, is responsible for the turf supply. Most small farmers own or rent a piece of bog and cut their own turf from it. But we leave Susanna and her baking and go back through the years to James Wilson. So from this land, wracked with poverty and unemployment, what kind of a country did James Wilson find? Well, America had already become a huge subcontinent, bustling with activity. It was opening up to the West, indeed it was exploding open to the West. Under the Jefferson administration, political changes were taking place with bewildering speed. And the one profession 
given James Wilson's skills in which a man could not possibly fail was the running of a newspaper. And that's exactly what he did, teaming up with another famous Irishman, William Duane. On the emigrant ship, James met Anne Adams from a nearby village and married her in America. Their son, Joseph Ruggles Wilson, became a Presbyterian minister and was the father of the 28th president, who dedicated the later years of his life to the cause of world peace. Their forebears braved the hazards of the North Atlantic to seek a new livelihood and a new liberty. We've seen something of the background of six out of a hat full of 14 Ulstermen, mostly Scotch-Irish, who became not only the citizens, but the makers and shapers and rulers of the United States of America. 